Welcome to the Local to Global podcast. I'm Nick Hugh. I spent something like 40 years in business and I ended up as an advisor to Lord Sugar on The Apprentice. Now, in this series, we're looking at why exporting is great for business. Whether you're starting a brand new company or looking to expand, selling overseas can make a huge impact in terms of increasing sales, growth and stability. But for many, the idea of selling abroad is truly daunting. In this podcast series, I'm talking to some of the UK's standout business founders and exporters to hear about their stories, to ruminate on their successes, failures, tips and strategies for trading internationally. Today, I'm joined by the founders of a sunglasses and ski goggle company who launched in 2013 with one of the most successful crowdfunding campaigns of its kind. A challenger brand in the market, the company called Sun God found immediate success across the world by offering high-quality eyewear at competitive prices. I'm joined by founders Zoe Armstrong and Ali Watkiss. Hello. Great to have you here, both of you. It's great to be here. Great to be here. Thank you. Let's start at the beginning of this extraordinary journey. Tell me how Sun God started and those initial crowdfunding campaigns that kicked everything off. So it was around five years ago now, so 2013. Ali and I were both working in London jobs, not super fulfilled for a variety of reasons and really looking for ways that we could escape. So we started researching, interrogating industries that perhaps we thought there was a gap in the market that we could really make an opportunity out of, really. And eyewear was where both of us came to. I think both of you, though, had a passion for something, where sunglasses were important. And I think you found that blinding white snow <laughs> of importance on the slopes. That's very true. We've both been keen skiers for a long time. We actually met in the mountains, and it was kind of destiny that we'll be uh, <laughs> running a company that provides products for those conditions. Often the great successes are driven by something, you know, by the passion that you've both got. It was skiing in your case. Now, what about crowdfunding campaigns? Why do you think yours was such a success? So I think for us, really, a lot of people saw the success afterwards and said to us, wow, gosh, it just snowballed, didn't it? Excuse the pun. But really, it's quite a science. So there was a lot of research and prep going into sort of the most popular campaigns on the site. Why were they popular? Ali and I really interrogated it, really, and went through the minds as to why was that one successful? Was it a short video? Was it long? What did they mention? What didn't they mention? And that, I think, gave us the best possible chance for success. We didn't bank on a success. We were actually very scared of a public failure <laughs> in front of a lot of friends and family. Um, because the crowdfunding tended to be in this country, tended to be through your network? It certainly has to start through your network. You have to get the initial kind of momentum from people, your friends and family. So it was really important that we convinced our friends and family first to support our project, and that would then give us the credibility so that the wider audience would also support us. Did it spread internationally, or was it... It, did. it, it did. definitely did, yes. So we got an, enough momentum, we got kind of the Indiegogo effect where it really accelerated. They started promoting us very heavily because it was a successful campaign, and that meant that our, our brand was being distributed globally from the beginning. And was that always your intention? Did you think to yourselves... We're going to go into the sunglasses market. We're fed up with all those expensive ones. We don't like those cheap ones. We're going to give a good middle market value for money, fashionable pair of bins to the market. Definitely. But was it always an international vision that you had? It was a very intentional move to go into a product that was fairly small and easy to ship globally. If you try to sell mattresses, it would be very difficult to be an international brand, whereas sunglasses are small and compact, and it's very cost-effective to ship them globally. The other big advantage we have is the two seasons between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And so by selling sunglasses to the, the Southern Hemisphere in our winter, it deseasonalizes our brand and allows us to kind of sell consistently throughout the year. So you had crowdfunding. Initially, it starts off family, friends, and it grows and grows. And suddenly, it's sort of an international effort. What about social media in getting that crowdfunding message out there? The amazing thing about social media is you can reach people all around the world from, from your local place. You're not restricted by country borders or anything else. You can post content and people consume it on the other side of the world. So it gives us a huge opportunity to globalise the business from day one. 
it's said that your effort, your crowdfunding effort, was one of the most successful. What sort of money are we talking about here? So for our first crowdfund campaign in sunglasses, we raised around £82,000, which obviously was fantastic for us. It gave us the cash flow we needed to quit our jobs and the impetus for the first production run of sunglasses. I think if we'd gone to a bank and said, could we have a bank loan to start a sunglasses company, I imagine they would have laughed us out of the door. <laughs> so it really did prove the idea and it proved the concept in the market, I think. So it gave you the opportunity to have a go. Yes, exactly. And there's no, no way we could have started without crowdfunding. Let's, let's yeah. switch to the, the products themselves. Your sunglasses and snow goggles come in a range of customizable options. Talk us through this now. OK, so we started with one sunglasses product and we offered a range of different coloured lenses, frames and icons and the logos in the, in the arms. And so the customers have the opportunity to choose what combination they want. So it gives us a lot more flexibility in offering a wider range of colours to customers and they get to choose exactly what they want. But you're up against some huge brands, fashionable, sexy brands. How about Oakley and Block, right? But you would argue, perhaps, I'm not putting words in your mouth, mm -hmm. that people are paying for the brand there, not for the product. Absolutely. I think it became very clear to us through the research process when we were sent samples and iterations of the product we ultimately wanted to launch that actually there was a lot of brand inflation in the market. There was the very high quality products, you know, Oakley and the other brands, which are fantastic, brilliant lenses. And then at the other end, there was sort of, you know, market stall pairs or the fashion high street brands, which actually after a week or two on holiday, you've broken them, you've scratched them. So I think as we started to receive the materials, we realised, wow, wait a minute, if we go direct to consumer with these products, I think we can offer a very comparable quality product, but without the crazy price point that not everyone wants to pay. Exactly. So. But, hold on, <laughs> now you've, you've got the idea, you've got the money, you want to go into this, you've got great passion. Who's going to make them for you? <laughs> what happened there? It was a slightly longer process than that. There's a number of online websites where you can start sourcing manufacturers. I started with a huge Excel spreadsheet. There was maybe 100 different suppliers we started talking to. And very quickly, just through the communication, you can learn who's going to work with you to develop the product you're looking for. And we progressively whittled it down to about five companies who we thought were suitable. And we then requested samples and we iterated through materials until we found a product that we thought was really correct for what we were looking to do. We set out with the aim of offering a product that could have a lifetime guarantee, so it would last for a lifetime. And so it was really important the materials we chose respected that kind of mission. We kept iterating through plastic composites until we found um, something that was suitable for the duration of life we were looking for. But you called upon the manufacturer to make to your spec. You weren't buying existing products off the shelf with an exclusivity for the UK or whatever. No, not at all. We looked to develop a, the materials. It was the really key thing. And then progressively add different styles that kind of fulfil all the requirements of, of the market. And you found yourself on a plane to China. <laughs> We did. That was a, an interesting few weeks. we just finished our crowdfund and we knew, wait a minute, we have close to three and a half thousand customers waiting on us. We've got to go out there and really check that the quality is to our specification. They're going to say, do what they say they would do. So it was an exciting few weeks. It was incredible actually seeing the whole process, meeting the contacts that we'd had so many emails with <laughs> in the previous weeks and really seeing how it all came together and understanding, I think. Are you telling me that you had already sold 3,500 sets of something that hadn't even started manufacturing yet? That's right. <laughs> Tricky. <laughs> Stressful. <laughs> what happened then? Because um, so you've got a time lag between, you know... Of pressing course. a button in China and finding the, a truck arriving at your door with the product. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we were acutely aware that these customers had really supported us from day one and they were waiting on these us. These were the crowdfunders in a way. Exactly, Thank yeah. You. OK, so they weren't complete strangers. It was part of your crowdfunding deal that you come on board and you get a, a Exactly, pair. yeah, exactly. And, and with that in your back pocket, you shot off to China <laughs> to see the people that you had found and identified on your... Excel spreadsheets, yeah? That's right, yep. How terrifying was all this when you <laughs> landed in wherever it was? It was it was a very large culture shock, certainly. It was very busy. It was We'd never been to China before. The language, obviously, is a, a big challenge in communicating with these people and making sure that we've understood each other. But it was also incredibly exciting seeing something so new, being in an opportunity to do business with these people and see the factories where our products were going to be made. And it was really comforting to see the kind of the standard and the quality of the companies that we had chosen to work with. 
they were two young people, really, with 82,000 quid in your back pocket, landing in China, going to see manufacturers. What persuaded you that the manufacturers were the right people for you? Because one can be taken for something of a ride sometimes. Of course, the period where we, um, we were waiting to fulfil these first 3,500 customer orders was probably one of the most stressful periods of our lives because we were so focused on delivering the best quality product to these customers. It was, it was a real pressure for us to deliver this product to these people because they had supported our project. So we made sure that there was no opportunity for the manufacturers to let us down. We made sure we revisited the factory as the product was finished and checked the quality of the product before it was shipped back to England and made sure that we made them aware of the potential scale of the business in the future so that we could continue to work with them in the future. Well, they like volume, and volume, of course, dictates the sort of lowering of the price to make it competitive. Then you're going to start shipping, and hold on a minute. There'll be a lot of startup people, perhaps listening to this podcast, I think, hmm, I like the sound of this. What tips would you uh, give them in terms of dealing with foreign manufacturers? What did you learn that actually you rather wish you had known before mm. you went there? I think be patient and be persistent and keep asking questions and asking questions and don't feel like they're doing you a favour because you're looking to do business on an equal footing and it's really important that they deliver a product to the specification that you're looking for. So don't be afraid to keep asking and keep pushing and to get the product that you're ultimately looking for. So there we are. You land, you've got in your back pocket £82,000 <laughs> and a list of um, 3,500 people who want... <laughs> expecting their sunglasses, their sun god sunglasses to arrive. So they were your first customers. Then what? You didn't sell through shops ever because you had already decided, I understand, e-commerce was the way. Forget retail. Absolutely. I think direct to customer and direct through our own channels was always something really important to us. I think what it allowed us to do was to completely control the brand process, so the customer experience, the packaging. You know, we were we were fulfilling all the pairs to begin with ourselves, so we really got to grips with exactly what that customer at the end was receiving. I think direct to customer is actually the way the industry is going in a lot of markets, and certainly for us, it's been a fantastic route to really, you know, manage to control the scaling up ourselves and not be dependent on the complexity of retailers or, you know, that whole chain that really adds a whole other dimension to and the business. And the margin. Exactly. And the margin, because, you know, you've got all the stuff in your warehouse, as it were, now. Out they go. Yeah, what we're doing by default is we are trying to undercut the big players, but with a comparable quality product. And as a result, we don't have those margins to play with. We'd rather put that into the packaging or the customer experience or the marketing. And I think that's to our benefit in the long run, hopefully. <laughs> no, for sure. So what you've got is um, speed. You keep your margin, which enables you to drop the price. But as time goes on and volume grows and the range grows, how are you going to deal with all that logistical side of it? You're going to have to start employing more and more people, and that cuts your margins. We are, yes. It's getting increasingly complicated for the fulfilment side of things. We worked with a, a company previously who we grew with for four years, and it got more and more complex. And in the end, we realized that this was something that was going to prevent us from growing further in the future. So we're always looking at ways to improve the processes we have in place. I think a really key benefit is we can hold all of our stock in one warehouse in the UK. We have one team assembling it so they know exactly what's required in terms of quality and how the products are assembled and how we want them to be shipped. And we're also working with a really good courier, so we're shipping worldwide. We can get products to Australia within two days, and that delights customers far beyond them going into a shop and picking a pair off the shelves. No, for sure. I understand that, yeah. You don't hold stock in Europe anyway. It's all in the UK, and that's where you deal with your worldwide sales, right? Exactly. That's where we're at at the moment. I mean, Two days to Australia is not bad, is it? It's... Yes, it, it really delights customers when we can deliver that quickly to Australia. So, so you've raised the money, you found a manufacturer, you've gone out and you're happy, they deliver and you deliver. You deliver within two days to Australia. What tips have you got for maybe another young couple somewhere who've got a great idea and they want to start an e-commerce business. What tips have you got for them? Logistically, crowdfunding, or indeed finding a foreign manufacturer? Is there anything that you've learned that you'd like to pass on? Yeah, so it's important not to take too many big risks. Test your assumptions first and then iterate and improve your ideas. So by starting on crowdfunding, we risked a very small amount of our own personal money before mm -hmm. we proved that people would buy the products that we were offering. 
And then through our website, we're constantly testing and improving and um, offering new ideas for the customers. I guess one of the dangers you've got is you've got a great idea, you know what you're doing, you know your market, but you haven't got the big bucks to market to advertise, to promote. How are you coping with this? Brand ambassadors, I think, is somewhere you're deeply involved. Absolutely. I think both brand ambassadors and our customers, so after the first four weeks when everyone received their pairs, they became almost our brand ambassadors. They were posting pictures, they were tagging us, and we were reusing that content to say, wait a minute, look, there's guys in America, guys in Australia, all loving their new sun gods. And that, for us, almost started off the user-generated content side of marketing. And we realised we don't need to necessarily spend, you know, the big bucks on photo shoots straight away. We do now for select partners or athletes. But actually, there's a lot you can do just with your own camera, friends you know who maybe want to come down to a photo shoot on the beach. Um, there really is a lot you can do without having to think, gosh, I've got to get a big bank loan or I've got to use my, spend my life savings on this marketing. There's really a lot you can do, I think, without going that far in the early days. I mean, the, I'm lifting up a pair of your sun gods now. It's a very discreet logo. Yeah. Was that an intentional thing? It was a very intentional move to make the logo less obvious. We didn't want it to be like a flash in the pan. We didn't want everyone to be suddenly wearing these products and then for it to go out of fashion very quickly. Mm -hmm. We're looking to build a long-term business which grows progressively and people don't get tired of. And we feel by reducing the kind of in-your-face branding, that's a really good way to kind of increase the longevity of your brand. The birth of Sun God really came out of Verbier, which is where you used to spend your uh, <laughs> winter months skiing, I think. And now you've got an office in Verbier. Do you think, you know, there's a great British crowd in Verbier, quite a moneyed crowd there. And if you sort of saturate that crowd with Sun Gods and they all go home in different directions, is that part of the thing? Yeah, I think Verbier actually, for us, it attracts a very international audience. So we are lucky, I think, when we have done events there in the past, the crowd, are, there are Scandinavians, there are Americans, and they do all come and they, they instantly get what we're trying to do. They get the adventure side of the brand. They ski, they hike, they're out in the elements. And hopefully the intention is that they then go home to those markets and tell their friends or tell their family and then perhaps come onto the website and are able to order online. So here we are, kicked off in... Uh... Verbier in London. How did you then pinpoint markets that you wanted to go to? So it was about two years into the brand. We had a product launch that went very well. It's now our best-selling pair of sunglasses. They're called Renegades. And we realised as a brand we were very seasonal. We really needed to find alternate markets so that our business was year round and you know it wasn't just three months of the year we were getting a paycheck. So we had a very successful online advert that we had run to the UK on Facebook. And I sort of thought, actually, why don't I try, just give it a go, put a few quid behind it, try targeting the likes of Australia and New Zealand with this very successful proven advert. And it took off. And I couldn't believe it. We were sort of looking at our sales and suddenly Australia in certain months was winning over the UK. We thought, right, there's something here. And it really went from there. That proved to us that actually from our bedrooms at the time back in London, we could actually target somewhere on the other side of the world with, you know, a compelling image. And that it sort of grew from there, really. <laughs> You've taken a little bit of a sponsorship plunge, I think, haven't you? You've become the official eyewear sponsor of the, the Free Ride World Tour. Now, tell us a bit about that and why, how much, and is it working? That's right. It was last year was the first year we sponsored the tour. We had been a low level partner with them for a few years, just doing pop ups here and there. And one of the big eyewear partners pulled out and they came to us and we thought between us, you know, there's no way we'll be able to reach a deal with those big guys. But actually, we were able to come to an agreement which was mutually beneficial, primarily with a limited edition product that they sell through their channels and we sell through ours. And that really, it's been fantastic for us as a brand from a credibility perspective. Mm. They're very well respected. They tour the world. They have some of the biggest names in freeride skiing. And so when people hear, wow, Sun God, the eyewear partner, I think that's a great thing for us as a, as a relatively small player up against these big brands who have been around for years. I mean, Sun God, you've told me that the whole basis of immediate international sales is the joy of e-commerce. So what's all this about opening a flagship store in the heart of uh, Verbier then? 
So it's something that increasingly some of our customers are asking us, is there anywhere I can try them on? Or is there anywhere, do you guys have a shop? Sometimes it's to know whether they can try them on. And sometimes it's because they want to know that we're a credible player and we're not just, you know, an e-commerce website that's going to fob them off. And so an opportunity came up about six months ago, right next to the co-working space that we work in now. And we sort of thought, actually, we're such an online brand. I think it's time for us to go into the physical world albeit still within the direct consumer model, mm. um, but time to really show people who are coming to town actually what we're about as a brand and bring them in a little bit closer, I think, to the brand than they are perhaps already. And for us, it was a very deliberate move to open a shop because it allows us to kind of get even quicker feedback from our customers and understand what they want and what they're looking for and what is missing from our product range. So by being able to have that direct face-to-face -face interaction with customers, it will allow us to develop the online side of the brand very quickly as well. Mm. You've alluded to the fact that the brand ambassador is one way to go. Facebook ads, fine, thank you very much. Uh, you've got your website, but brand ambassador, they're in amongst your market, aren't they? How many have you got? How do you pay them? And does it work out for you? So I believe now we have over a thousand brand ambassadors. So that really has grown exponentially over the last few years. We pick them with a mix of criteria, really looking on social media, finding out people who are either in the right market, so the Southern Hemisphere or the rest of Europe, which we're trying to grow as a key market for us. Are they into the right sports? Do they create good content? Normally, it's a short message. We love what you're doing, your travels, your content. We'd love to sort you out with a pair of sunglasses in return for, you know, a photo here and there on your travels, you know, at the top of an epic mountain or, or wherever that might be. And it's very mutual, but mutually beneficial, sorry. So you pick the right sort of guy or girl, yeah, and it's not expensive. And they're happy to get a pair of sun gods in the post yeah. and, and it goes from there. And actually, I guess you can keep recruiting and recruiting and recruiting. Not so expensive. If these are retailing at 60-odd pounds, I dare say you've got a decent margin, so it's not too expensive, is it? No, it's not too expensive. And the amazing thing is relationships with some of these ambassadors have developed so quickly over time that they're, they're posting about us on a regular basis and we keep sending them product, and it's just that they're part of our family. They're part of kind of what we're building. They feel that they're part of a movement and they want to keep working with us. So it's not the sort of David Beckhams of this world or <laughs> perhaps the high-profile people who really need paying? No, we have, a, we, we have a team of pro athletes who we support because they're travelling the world and competing, and so it's important that we give them some financial support. Okay. Um, those are the people at the very top of their game. So we're talking James Woods, freestyle skier, Hannah Whiteley, who's a, a weight kite surfer. So really, really top-end sports people, and we're happy to support them. And in return, they're always feeding back on our products and telling us how we can make them better and how we can improve. And yeah. what's next for you guys? Continued growth. I think there's a huge opportunity in the, the industry that we're working in. I think a lot of the other companies are very slow to adapt to a direct-to-consumer model. I think we have a huge opportunity to become the main direct-to-consumer player in the eyewear industry. Um, so we're going to keep iterating and improving and trying to achieve that aim. What I think is wonderful is that two young people have got a passion, they go for it, they raise the money, not a lot, £82,000, they get on their bikes, they go to China, they found a manufacturer, they know that the world is their market, really, and they can get to their market by e-commerce. And here we are, a range of sunglasses known as Sun God. Thank you so much, Zoe, and Ali, too. Thank you so much for joining me. That's all for this episode of the Local to Global podcast. To start your own exporting journey, visit great.gov.uk or contact your regional Department for International Trade Office. Until the next time, from me, Nick Hewer, it's goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>